Well, film opinions are very dangerous. Uh, best friends can wonder who they are when they disagree about a film. Uh, you, if you disagree with a, about a film with someone, you can actually wonder if, how they could even be your friend. It's a very serious and delicate area. Uh, when anybody asks me, what do I think of a film, especially a contemporary film or a film being out now, I usually just say, I hear it's very good. It's the best thing to say. Because people uh, invest their psyches in the cinema, almost like the way you would invest your psyche in your dream. And if you tell someone you didn't like their dream, they're mortally wounded and wonder who you are. So you're asking a dangerous question. I don't care for that director at all. Uh, and uh, I think what he stands for uh, is antithetical to what the book is about. The book is about uh, direct experience. It's not about image representing language concept idea. And um, he doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me. I respect its, I respect its um, seriousness, its intent, uh, the quality of how it's done. But it's uh, for another kind of animal than I am. It's uh, like asking a cat to eat marshmallows. It just doesn't work. Yeah. Well, I think uh, when one is uh, fully conscious, when one is fully conscious, uh, one is aware that one is seeing. Uh, when one is semi-conscious, one is just seeing. But when you're fully conscious, because where you have a human mind, we can actually perceive that we perceive. Uh, to perceive that we perceive, in a way, is the seed of wisdom. It's the seed of a deep, deep devotional sense of what it is to be the mystery of being a human being. So uh, that's what I'd like my films always to be about. So to see the perceiver and what is perceived simultaneously in a union, I think, makes for devotional cinema. It's a very strange director. <laughs> I love the Disney's uh, films very, very much. Uh, I, love the, I loved his uh, wildlife films uh, that he was making in that period of time in the 50s. Uh, there's films called uh, Beaver Valley and Nature's Half Acre. And it was the first time one had the opportunity, for instance, to see a time-lapse shot of a flower. Uh, and it was deeply magical. Um, I think I'm very influenced by Disney. I think Disney, uh, Ozu, um, Antonioni, you know, are my uh, main influences, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. No, I think they're all very uh, filmmakers who produce, who express themselves through direct vision. You know, maybe some are more appropriate for different ages. Uh, though I saw Pinocchio lately, I was babysitting, and I was uh, very impressed. What did you like about it? That every moment was done with such care and such uh, visual thoroughness. No one was saving money. No one was trying to get away with anything. There was someone there who was being very generous and offering uh, all they could at each moment. I don't know what John thinks of Disney. <laughs> uh, you know, the film Alia obviously ends where you have the, hopefully the revelation that the microcosm or the semi-microcosm of the sand world is comparable to the star world. And that uh, I know myself, whenever I hear uh, uh, human beings being excited about going to Mars or something, I feel like they're just little, uh, a, a little bug uh, on, on a huge beach going uh, three inches across a sand beach. In other words, the vastness of the universe and the uh, vastness of the, of the sand uh, are sisters, you know. I think the object in filmmaking, at least in devotional filmmaking, is to touch 
the world in such a way that its beauty and its transparency are, uh, occur simultaneously for the viewer. I don't know what else to say. Uh, there's revelation all around us, and it's a question of uh, caring about that. Uh, most films are concerned with uh, people's problems and when, whether they will be resolved or not by the end of the film. Uh, I, I, I enjoy those films as much as anyone. But there's something about being a solo, one-person filmmaker. Uh, there's the opportunity to express aloneness and offer the audience uh, a shared aloneness. Um, you know, if you're out with other people and you see something beautiful and you say, oh, isn't that wonderful, it kills the moment already. So how, here's an opportunity to share with other people without uh, destroying the without destroying the situation. I think to, uh, to share uh, aloneness with other people, you know, is uh, a great, uh, uh, should I say, sol um, a great answer to loneliness. To share aloneness is a great answer to loneliness, you know. I am a bit under shock that you dislike Tarkovsky, because what you're saying is actually profoundly Tarkovskyan. And he's one of the cinematographers, directors that I love. And so our friendship is already shaking. Yeah, in trouble. Uh, but he was a great advocate of direct experience and a great advocate of um, non-mediated, transparent sensuality, bodiless sensuality, which your films made me think of. So I could feel the maybe perhaps the questions and the elemental collections and phenomenological and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, I think it's a beautiful way of, of describing this moment, I think, and the moment of the projection as well, both for you and for some of us as a sort of uh, possibility for hazardous illumin illumination of sorts. So yeah, our friendship can recommence now. <laughs> I, I, it, might, it may be, a, mo it may be a, a quality of temperament. Do you know what I'm saying? In other words, uh, we, could be, we could stand on a corner and, and you could tell me who you thought was cute and I could tell you who I was thought was cute. And they might be different people, you know? So, yeah. There's also something psychosexually strange about Tchaikovsky, which I don't know if I should say publicly. <laughs> something which makes me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, Antonioni in black and white is heaven. <laughs> in color, he's nothing. Yeah. Okay. See, that's something we agree on. I yeah. love Antonioni in black and white, and I don't like him at all in color. His black and white films are uh, the very height of narrative cinema. I mean, his first feature, Chronicle of a Love Affair, is incomparable. Yeah, see? We, we could be friends. We just don't talk about the tea subject. Yeah. Okay. It's extraordinarily important because the films don't exist except for the way they're shown. Uh, so it isn't like they're just shown and then, you know, it's a whole thing. I guess Erwin is in here. I went through a long, a long thing with Erwin when he invited me here. Uh, Will you be able to show silent films, silent speed films uh, at the festival in a good way? And he went out of his way to guarantee me we're not only going to show them every day in the same theater. <laughs> is that, is that this is like Johnny Carson? It means we're, it's time for an ad? <laughs> and anyway. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's extremely important. And uh, the situation, I know you were sitting a little closer in the back. Uh, this is the supreme situation here. Erwin uh, didn't even know if it would be good because it's a new theater and they had to bring in a special 16 projector. But this is, I appreciate it Im immensely. It's extraordinary. Yes, everything. The films don't exist except for how they're projected. I think for, for many artists, the, the sublime moments of, of childhood are the reference point for the sublime. 
uh, they're the reference point for reality. I think as a young person, you know that moment you're in reality. When you're not uh, playing some societal game, but you're deeply of yourself and in the world, and you know that's real. And so I trust it. In a, in a certain way, these are sort of art films for 10-year-olds. <laughs> Someone asked me if children ever have seen them. I don't, they haven't. But in a way, they're, should we say, they're art films for the inner 10-year-old. <laughs> I, didn't, I wasn't aware that, that I mean, Europeans uh, aren't in touch with their original uh, untampered nature. Yeah. I don't know. They have a nicer society than we do. <laughs> maybe, maybe Americans are forced to be, uh, you know, to find the truth within themselves because the society is so ragged and the country is so torn apart by so many forces which are destructive to it. The country's in a terrible state, spiritually. I don't know what to say. There, there, can be a, uh, uh, there can be a beautiful screening in a very professional situation like this, if everything is attended to and the audience is cooperative. I mean, there's nothing better than what happened in the last two nights for me here. But you can also have a great screening just in some art gallery with a projector in the room and 30 people. Uh, they're initially made in my own apartment, for me alone. Uh, I show them to friends who see them in my apartment, just one-on-one. -on -one. They say, th then they're spoiled forever. Uh, I think they have a variety of ways they can be seen. Is it really a question as if they're shown well and the audience uh, is cooperative, you know? And uh, so far, this has been extraordinary, at least for me, you yeah. Come on, someone. Something controversial, something. <laughs> but, uh, pardon? <laughs> but, no, nothing. <laughs> what, what did you say? No, it was too controversial. <laughs> Come on. No, no, please. <laughs> no, no let, uh, one other one. He was just trying to cause trouble. He was actually a projectionist about 10 years ago when I first showed films in Amsterdam. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that um, they're, they're, yes, I'm actually very involved. Uh, I'm a terrible Buddhist, uh, but a wonderful result of Buddhism. <laughs> I think that was what I said. The worst Buddhist you can imagine, but a, a great uh, fruition of Buddhism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a beautiful one. Yes, okay. So yeah. Okay. <laughs>